I'm going to call you the grand master of storytelling. A uh, story is a, a metaphor for life. And you are learning without being taught. You're absorbing life through these stories. Talent is not creating from nothing. That is published and produced. Why can't my be published and produced? That is like the best way to explain what's been happening over the last 20 years. Art forms evolve. AI is a tool. The fundamental process is not changing as long as I can talk. I will never stop. You've mentioned that there's two different skill sets that go into great storytelling. There's the storytelling itself and then the actual like writing of things. Yes. I feel like people get more caught up in the writing side and they maybe forget how important story is from a structure point of view. Can you walk us through what makes for a great story? Well, that's like asking, you know, what makes for great music? Yes, people do get caught up in the language on the page as opposed to the subtext of what psychologically and socially is really going on. And there's two reasons. One is the words are the only things that people read, and so they want that to be impressive. Fine. But the more important reason why people tend to neglect the life of the story and put all their emphasis in language is because story is the hard thing to do. Language is the easy thing to do. You can talk. You can convert your talk or your inner thoughts to words on a page. You can play with those words in many ways. And uh, that, in a very real way, is easier. Figuring out who are these people, what do they want, why do they want it, how do they go about getting it, what's stopping them when they do, what are the consequences of those actions? It gets requires insight and wisdom and imagination. And so uh, people get stuck. They can't figure out what would this character do, or they may be forced then to uh, import a cliche. And so their characters will do what characters of that kind have always done. And their story will be, you know, imitative of everything they've ever seen. And so in, in a sense of that, they realize that this is not really very original. And so how do I make it original? I use words nobody else ever used. <laughs> you, you crack open the thesaurus and you yeah. just start fluffing everything exactly. up. Exactly. You know, there's reasons for everything. And uh, story is the hard part. Story means an understanding of life that you're going to express that is somehow deeper, different, better than anybody else, an understanding of human psychology and relationships between human beings that is fresh and new and better somehow than else, it's very hard to be original. And it requires real knowledge and great creative talent, imagination to accomplish. And so the writing is the easy part. If it's hard to be original, should we try to be original at first? Or is there something to telling? I mean, there's the same stories told over and over and over again. And we like that. I mean, I don't like it at the end of the movie when the hero loses. And I go, what, did, what was the point of this? I want the hero to win. Well, and I don't like it when the boy loses girl, boy gets girl back, boy loses girl again. What happened there? I want that to all work out. So there's something to like, I want stories to play out the way I want them to play out, but I still want some surprises along the way. Yeah, well, the difference is, you know, in, the, in those very raw patterns, like, you know, the lovers meet, the lovers are attracted, but then the lovers quarrel and blah, blah. Yes, I mean, there's, the human experience has certain limitations. How many different ways can two people meet, fall in love, and struggle toward the commitment, right? A pattern is what happens to human beings. And so, that or a crime is committed, a crime is discovered, right? These patterns are universally human because it's what happens in life. <laughs> the difference is, yes, a crime will be committed, a crime will be discovered, right? An investigation will take place. So there'll be forces of, of antagonism one way or another, but not the same way. And so, yes, essentially, certain events are archetypal in life. 
You're born, you live, you die. And that's not going to change. And so there are certain experiences in life that are universal for all human beings. But the difference is that a writer is to take those archetypal experiences and patterns of existence and express them uniquely because, yes, these patterns repeat, but not the same way. Not in the same behaviors, not for the same reasons, and not with the same outcomes and so forth. And so fine writing takes these archetypal experiences and it investigates them with an imagination and insight and shows that, yes, these things happen, but in a unique, character-specific, culturally specific way that only the writer has seen, witnessed, or experienced, or imagined. And so uh, the difference is not what happens, it's how it happens, and why it happens, and when it happens, and where it happens, and to whom it happens. And so all of that is up for grabs. Hmm. So you grew up in Michigan and Ohio, and you went to University of Michigan and studied arts and English, and then in the 70s started working in Hollywood for studios and in television. What happened in your career that took you from someone who was learning the craft of script writing and storytelling to starting to teach seminars and starting to teach others this? How did you transition from someone who was doing this? Someone who's like, ah, I have a gift for helping others do this too. Oh, that's good. Good question. Because if you left out a huge shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's go to the middle then. If that's the juicy uh, middle part. Yeah, I never lived in Ohio, but I did. I was born in Michigan. I went to the University of Michigan, and I studied English and English degree, theater and a master's degree, film and a PhD. And after a master's in theater, I was a professional actor, director, mostly director in the theater. I directed something over um, 60, 60 some plays. And I acted professionally in almost that number two. So I had a very good career going in New York. And uh, for some suicidal reason, (laughs) I decided... I, I was bored. I got bored with the theater because uh, in those days, the really innovative creativity was uh, in the movies. <clears throat> and this, you know, foreign films and Hollywood films were brilliant. And so I was working in New York and I was thinking, you know, I'm directing off Broadway. Someday I might get to direct on Broadway. And what will it be? So then I got a PhD in film and I went out to uh, Hollywood because I thought that's where the creative action is. In many ways, back then in the 80s. Why get the PhD? Did that help you? Common sense told me that uh, you should study film. In fact, you're right. And I went back, I said, I want to get a master's in film. And they said, but you already have a master's. And so a, a PhD is a master's with a dissertation. And so you might as well do a PhD and, you know, and write a dissertation, and then you'll be Dr. McKee. And if things don't work out in show business, you could always teach a university somewhere. So that's how I became a PhD, just simply because otherwise it would have been redundant. And so I studied film for a few years and I had to write a dissertation, which I never finished. And I had to find a subject. I wanted to do a dissertation on the war genre in film. And I saw a pattern in war movies back from the silent era to the modern era of changing geography of war and the hierarchy of started out always stories about officers, then sergeants, then privates, and then in the brig. <laughs> and so and I thought, well, now I gotta watch a hundred war movies to get my and I, I didn't want to do that. So uh, and, I, and it was approved. My subject was approved. My dissertation people were really upset with me when I thought, I'm going out to Hollywood, so I, why don't I do a study on something that would be useful? And uh, so I started to study uh, structure, story structure in film. And uh, and then when I, I got to uh, California to make money, I taught part-time at USC Film School and so forth. 
And I used what I knew, what I studied in the prep for my PhD thesis or dissertation. I used that as the foundation for my teaching in uh, film schools. And uh, people found it very exciting, very helpful. And then there was a private film school that for a few years in LA called Sherwood Oaks Experimental College. And the premise of that was that uh, only professionals would teach. And I'd written screenplays, of course, and I had sold them and uh, waiting for them to, you know, in development hell, waiting for them to get produced. But they hired me to teach writing there at Sherwood Oaks. And uh, eventually they went out of business. It was successful, very successful the first years because Dustin Hoffman was teaching actors. Sidney Pollack was teaching directors. And uh, it was very badly managed. And so it went on business. But I was, every time I taught a story structure course, the population would double or triple. And eventually they had to have a huge auditorium for hundreds of people to hear my lectures. What is the substance of story? What they were teaching, what other people teach, is how to imitate other people. (laughs) I love that. Here's what a classic Hollywood film does. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. They were teaching how to imitate other people. But what I thought was what story is the substance of story and how you build a story by increasing the levels of antagonism and how you build a story from the inside out based on human desire, meeting forces, negative forces in life and adjusting and coping beat by beat building scenes, and so forth. So I taught story from the inside out. Other people teach from the outside in. And apparently, what the way I taught captured people's uh, imagination and made them think and believe that if they understood story from the inside out, they could bring something to life that would really be unique and fresh and uh, good, you know, moving for people to watch. So anyway, when Sherwin Oaks went out of business, I put a little ad in the L.A. Times that said, Story Structure, Robert McKee, blah, blah, and the phone never stopped ringing. And so I had to rent an auditorium. And then I got calls from New York and then from Europe, and it took over my life. So, I mean, you set out when you graduated and you're acting, when you were directing, when you decided that the actions in Hollywood, I mean, you didn't set out to have this career, even, <clears throat> even take this path. And so can I ask during that period of time, when you're going to school, when you're directing, when you're acting, when you're getting your master's, when you're getting your PhD, did you not have this sense of impatience? Did it feel like this was a career that you were building step by step by step and doing what you wanted? Or did it always feel like, when will my real career begin? Oh, I never had that thought. First time I was ever on stage, I was eight years old, playing the lead in a little kid's play called uh, Martin the Shoemaker. I played Martin in Martin the Shoemaker. And uh, I knew when I was eight years old, this is what I wanted. First time I stepped on stage, I actually got a laugh on purpose, arranging a table, and I did it in a way that made people laugh. And when they laughed, I, I was hooked. And I don't know who the teacher was that saw this in me, that I should be Martin the Shoemaker in that play. And then I started to direct, even in high school. I directed the, at a you know, community theater and all that. And so I've been acting and directing since I was you know, literally eight years old. And so I never looked back. I never had any doubts. No. And, I, you know, I knew show business. I mean, in show business, the, you know, it, if you can just keep working, it's not a question of becoming a star. It's just, can I do this instead of something else? I mean, can I just keep working, making a living, paying rent, and feeding myself, working in the theater, or do I have to go get a job in a department store? I mean, whatever it is. And the thought that maybe this will someday make me famous was never in my mind. I was very happy in regional theater, off-Broadway, off off Broadway, and as long as I could go from play to play to play, I was a you know a happy camper. And as I said, I decided that I wanted to take it to film 
because I thought that the subject matter, the content of films back in the 80s was more exciting, in fact, than the subject matter in Broadway plays. And uh, I always knew if I work, I will make a living. But one of the things I did between acting or directing jobs uh, was I was a private detective. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah I worked for uh, a company called Investigative Associates in uh, Detroit, Chicago, and uh, Korean Associates, another detective firm in San Francisco. And so anytime I was between gigs as an actor or director, I would just go to a detective agency and say, I'm an experienced private detective. And they would have files stacked to the ceiling and say, get your ass up here. No. <laughs> Because they were always overloaded with, with work. They could never catch up. The detective firms work for lawyers, They're lawyers in lawsuits, lawyers defending criminals. And so lawyers constantly need investigations. And so the amount of work, and very few people are good at that, investigating. And so there was always work and it was very well paid. So mm-hmm. I always knew that, you know, whatever happens, I'm always going to make a living. That's not a problem. That's so interesting. When a band puts out their first album, the initial album is usually the most remarkable stuff because it's the collection of all their best of the best over the years. And then everyone knows about the sophomore slump because they're busy touring the first album. Yeah. And they have to now somehow come up with a second album that's even better. And you know, often you have to go live some life. So that way you have that creative muse to come up with stuff. I have to imagine that your time directing, your time moving from New York to Hollywood, your time as a private detective, was that you off living life to be able to learn about the psychology of people, to be able to watch people, to be able to pick up stories? Yeah, being a private investigator takes you into corners of life from the wealthiest people to the ghetto and everything in between and into uh, corporate life, into, of course, law firms, but also uh, doctors, manufacturing, many of all enterprises, all business, wherever people are employed, wherever people live and whatever way they live, they're going to be investigated. And so as a kid growing up in the suburbs of Detroit, being a private detective opened up uh, insights into life and what people do and why they do it and how they think they're going to get away with it that you can't get any other way that I know of. And the other thing, of course, is reading. So you read novels and plays, of course, to perform them. And so you've got great minds, great writers, Shakespeare on. And when you're acting and directing, you have to take life apart as expressed in this play. And now you've got to think about why do people do the things they do in order to communicate that to an actor as you're interpreting the play word by word, moment by moment, trying to figure out what makes human beings do the things they do and how do they do it? And what do they say and do while they're doing it? (laughs) And so living in the theater where you're constantly investigating life and then if I was between jobs, investigating life for professionally, you learn a lot. And so when we switch back to store, you've launched this program. It's You're getting called all over the world. You have to rent larger and larger rooms because you're breaking down story unlike other people. What are the elements that go into a great story? How can we become better storytellers? Well, to become a better storyteller is a big... I would rather put it this way. How can I become a more truthful storyteller? How can I understand life in myself as the only human being I ever really know and other people by implication? And how can I express that in a way that is more truthful, more beautiful than anything I've done before. And if that's your focus, you would get better. Putting it the other way around, how can I become a better writer? Tempts people to copy. How can I become a writer as good as, and then name name your favorite, right? Which is fine up to a point. I mean, you have to read, you have to study what other writers do, see how they do it and so forth. And realize that you've got a long way to go in your career. My wife 
is a novelist, and she, she's reading uh, Novikov these days. And uh, she just she's in the middle of Lolita, and he absolutely takes her breath away. And and so she turned to me just this morning, and she said, "I'm not going to write anymore. I will never be as good as Novikov. He's a genius." Writer. And I said, "That's you know, you you should go back and find the very first thing that Novikov wrote." And read that first. Starting with Lolita is where he was at his pick, right? And so that how can I become a better writer? One way is to recognize what is better, and that means studying other people's writing. But then you've got to do it. And it's not a question of me mastering the form, how beats build scenes, how scenes build sequences, how sequences build acts, how acts of long form build movements to a crisis, a climax, resolution. Understanding uh, that that form is you know, critical. You have to master that form. You have to understand it and be able to do it yourself. But all of this is predicated on the notion that you have something to say. And what I've learned over the years is that people just assume they've got something to say, or even worse, they take the attitude, well, you know, most of the things I see or read are shit. A lot of shitty television, a lot of shitty movies, a lot of, and God knows on stage and the theater is a lot of bad plays in the last 20, 30 years, and then a lot of really bad novels of one kind or another, so-called memoirs and whatnot sell millions of copies, and uh, surely my work must be better than that shit. Right? If that shit is published and produced, why can't my shit be published and produced, right? <laughs> that uh, that is shit, like the best way to explain what's been happening over the last 20 years. My, my shit is better than that shit, okay? And the truth of the matter is, no, it's not. Your shit is exactly like their shit. Unless you... Take the time to think about what it is to be a human being, what it is to be in human relationships, really think about it, study it, imagine the possibilities, dig deep into human nature and come to understand life and people's behavior in ways that only you would know so that you have something to say. Because it's pointless for me to teach you how to say it if what you've got to say is being out. There's no real today. I've been doing this for 40 years. And uh, when I look around, I don't see the story back when it was true. There was a lot of failed storytelling. The storytelling today is much better. I'm surprised to hear that, that it's better better because it somehow feels more shallow. Uh, and I it mean, is. Maybe. And it, it's because it is. The stories are well told technically, but they don't have any substance. The problem today is not technically storytelling. The problem today is content. It's form and content. And so I've been working hard. I wrote books on character. I wrote books in dialogue. I wrote books for business people. And Storynomics is a book for the story in, in marketing. And so I've worked hard in the last years to make it clear that, yes, story, you have to master that technique. You don't understand how stories work. Well, fine. But now you have to have something to say. And that means understanding character. Understanding human beings, human relationships, and going deep psychologically and sociologically into the human thing and having insight, knowing something about human beings that uh, others haven't ever thought or seen yet. And so the problem today is not that the storytelling is technically flawed. It's a matter of content. When something comes along, like uh, the Banshee and Sharon, or a really wonderful film, I thought the best film last year was All Quiet on the Western Front. 
And the insight into what it is to be a human being in war with your comrade. Are you, are you drawn to that because you almost uh, had a dissertation on war movies? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Maybe you're primed to love yeah, this type I, of storytelling. Yeah, I like war movies because I like the war genre as a genre because it's the ultimate human conflict. And here we are now, 2023, previous 20 some years, we thought that war was a thing of the past and that modern life would move on. And then comes the Russia invades Ukraine. And now we're up to another major war in Europe after thousands of years of European warfare. Here we are doing it all again. And it is the greatest suffering that it causes, the greatest impact and change affecting the whole world. Even the food supply of the world is now in jeopardy because the Ukraine was the, you know, the grain capital of the world. On it goes. And so the consequences of war are on a scale on like no other. So re- re- real quick, I haven't seen All Quiet on the Western Front, but it's, but it's magnificent. It really is. I so, so, but it's gotten such negative press. You know how to make a no- war novel adaptation. No, it, um, no you're, it, you're it flattens the complexity of war. That's what the Atlantic said. So, what do you love about it? That that variety in the Atlantic, and all these people are like, "This is not a good war movie." It's a brilliant war movie, and it's war told not the complexity of war. I don't know. Somebody at the Atlantic said that? At the Atlantic, all quiet on the Western Front flattens the complexity of war. That's so, that's so blind. And I subscribe to the Atlantic. I should. <laughs> so, so do I. You can reach out to Brandon Tensley, the author. <laughs> he says that it falls into the classic war film trap, all flash and hardly any feeling. Well, that's his problem. If he didn't feel that, uh, it's not a problem with the film. That's a problem with uh, with him. It's not war technically. It's not war told from a global point of view. It's war told from the point of view of some poor squad who thinks that going to war and fighting for your country is the most meaningful thing you can do with your life. And he goes into war positively, looking forward to a great, grand experience and doing something intensely, profoundly meaningful. And then he discovers how meaningless it all is. And so this guy who's telling the thought wants us to know about the complexity of war thinks that war is meaningful. Complex and meaningful. I mean, how can something be complex that isn't meaningful? And so he's got a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of war. And so I would object to his review. All Quiet on the Western Front, the novel is a masterpiece. The film's been made three or four times over the years. And this new German version is the most superb. And it's a very personal story of a human being going from meaningfulness to meaninglessness and war is the great adventure to war as absurd. And so I highly recommend it. And by the way, cherry picking the critics there a bit because the vast majority of film critics thought it was a masterpiece. I guess so. I just went to Google and typed it in and went over the news and those were the right. first things to come up. Well, so. I, I, I wrote a piece about the Oscars this year. And uh, what do you think of the Oscars? Because there's been this whole move to obviously more diversity and Hollywood has always been a leading voice in terms of shaping culture. No, you Uh, you got it the wrong way around. No, it's the other way around. Uh, Hollywood is always following culture. It's not leading. It's always interesting. I was under the impression and I, I would love to be corrected. I was under the impression that that the bi coastal nature of more progressive cities develops culture, Hollywood captures this and then figures out a way to package it for the more conservative kind of Midwest. Well, between those bi-coastals, there's a lot of human beings and their cultures too. But you're right, in the sense that is that cultural forces are titanic. They're economic, they're religious, they're they're rooted in, in the environment. 
the health of people, the relationships within families and whatnot. I mean, the, the, the cultural forces are powerful. They are subterranean. They go on underneath things and you cannot control them. They're beyond control. They happen as things happen. And I mean, I'm an old Marxist who believes in these massive, huge forces in society from Mother Nature herself to the most technologically advanced and everything in between. These forces operate through our lives in ways that we're not aware of. They're pushing us and pulling us in different ways. And uh, when you finally become aware of it, you know, it's, so it's an epiphany. But in fact, it's been going on for decades. When it gets to the surface enough that, that scholars and artists, scholars write about it, artists express it, but it's been going on. And, but it's now reached a point where it's visible or understandable, seeable. And so the notion that Hollywood leads culture is nonsense. Hollywood is a reaction. Art in general, novels, plays, painting, music, are reactions to forces that have been going on for who knows how long, that are changing and pushing the world in one way or another, and they get to a point where certain people with insight, scientists, business people, artists, see through that and recognize, oh, Jesus, look, you know, things are changing. And so the diversity in Hollywood, for example, America has been diverse since we genocided the Indians and imported African slaves in 1619, and people from all over the world, East and West, have come to America. America has been diverse for 400 years. Right? Yes. Now Hollywood is waking up to that. Oh, there's more, like, oh, there's, there's more than just there's white dot guys, eh? People. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> Hollywood is not leading. Anything. Hollywood is all is is one of the art forms, and all art forms are reactive. And artists are people with antennae and sensitivity for the subtext. And they come to realize the real reasons things happen. It's not what they teach you in school. It's whatever. They real reasons things are happening. And they try to work with those forces and create stories to express that. Mm. But those things have to have happened to a point near the surface where the artist with insight can get it. So this is where you're talking about when you have to have something worth saying. That's right. It's it's recognizing the shift or having a perspective or connecting the dots and having that insight. Right. A, a little bit ahead of the curve. Yeah. But you're not inventing it. You're yeah. simply noticing and reacting no, to what's taking place. You, you can't invent reality. Well, no, this is interesting to me because when I went to film school, I never felt creative enough. Because frankly, I'm not the type of person to like invent stuff. And yet I am very good at synthesizing a lot of information, connecting dots and going, yeah. Oh, here's the root cause. And so I've always felt not creative enough to be a creative. And yet everyone else is like, Mark, you're very, very creative. And, and you are now, <laughs> I'm turning 40 this week. You are now helping me realize why this might be. Well, it's a process and uh, it, wanting to express something in an art form, you first of all have to uh, discover the art form. And that usually happens, you know, when you're a little kid, they take you to a museum, you see paintings. Step on stage at the age of eight and get a laugh. <laughs> yeah, you get captured by this. And then it's a lifelong struggle to take whatever medium that you want to express yourself in and use it as well as you can and uh, learn how to execute it and then have something to say. And <clears throat> having something to say is really not, if you don't have talent and you've got something to say, you'll never be able to say it very well. And talent is in your genes. You either have it or you don't. 
you can't make untalented people fine writers. I mean, they have to, you know, starting point, I presume, that the people I'm teaching have talent. Think it can be developed if you want it no. bad enough and are willing to work hard enough? You, you think you're born with it or you're not? Really? You can't develop what your genes. No, you're born with your genes. And talent is a gene. Just like IQ, it's a gene. You can't be more intelligent than your IQ will allow. There are limitations. You can't be a better athlete than your body will allow. You have limitations, and talent is one of them. That's interesting because you know I had Muggsy Bose on the podcast, and he's five foot four, the shortest guy in the history of the NBA, and yet he used it for his advantage. He could never be Michael Jordan, but he could be Muggsy. Oh, Bose. he could sneak. He could sneak around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember him. I know my hand-eye coordination. Okay, I played golf throughout my life. And I was a single digit handicap until I got into my seventies and then went up. But I was never going to be a scratch player. I'm sorry. I just didn't have the touch. I could never, I I was a good five handicap, six handicap all my life. And I tried and tried and tried and tried to get down to be three, two, one. And there are limits. (laughs) Talent is a team. It's a right brain power. Talent in a nutshell is the mental ability to discover the hidden connection between two things that already exist, but a third thing that connects them in a way no one else has ever done before. That's Mm -hmm. talent. It's analogical Mm -hmm. logic, and it takes place in the right brain. The left brain is the rational deduction, induction, causal logic thinking part of the brain. The right brain, they tell us, is a wild place. And talented people discover connections that nobody else has ever seen before. So, for example, that famous little poem that they, when we were in grade school, it's called The Fog by Carl Sandburg. And there's a, a trope in it. He says... The fog moved in on little cat's feet. The fog rolled in on little cat's feet. He found a relationship between fog, which is weather, and cat's feet, which is biology. There is no relationship between them until he discovered one, which is that they're both Extremely quiet. Hmm. Because yeah, it goes on to say, it sits looking over harbor and city on silent hunches and then moves on. And then moves on. And so he's a talent. He found a relationship between fog and cat's feet no one else had ever seen before. That is creativity. That is talent. The discovery of the third thing that links two things that already exist. Talent is not creating from nothing. Talent takes what already exists, discovers the relationship, hidden relationships between things, and puts new things into the world based upon things that already exist. It, you are blowing my mind right now. <laughs> oh, well, I, I love this. I love this so much because... I'm a huge fan of comedy and yeah. it's, you know, if you break down a, a joke, yeah. uh, Jimmy Carr is one of my more favorite comedians and he's, you know, he's not for everyone, but he really breaks down the structure of comedy, which is I'm going to take you down one way. Right. You are going to think that I'm talking about one thing, but then I'm going to yeah. say something that actually reveals to you that and I was talking about something. And it's totally else. the path we took before. Yeah. And, and the path we took to begin with, creates emotion. Yeah. The punch destroys that at the reason. That tension, that, 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 that yeah. either that tension or the, or the, or the joke or whatever. And so you're, you're, you're doing this thing of connect, of taking the two things and then adding the third right. to make a connection that no one saw coming. And that's what laughter is. Laughter, see, a joke creates emotional energy in people. 
That's how we talk about sex. We talk about death. We talk about, you know, you create an emotional energy in people and then you cut it off. And there's an emotion now with no place to go. There's an emotion with no reason for being. And so how do you get rid of that emotion? You explode air out of your lungs. You shake your body. Laughter is the getting rid of a now pointless emotion. And so this, the structure of a joke is you build that energy in people and you cut it off with a punch from off the wall so that laughter is an emotion that has been abandoned by thought. And so you have to get rid of it. And in the design of a joke, you see the creative process at its absolute purest. You see creativity happen, right? In front of you. That's just brilliant, right? There's a great book called The Act of Creation by Arthur Kessler. The first third, it's about, about creativity, the act of creation. The first third of the book is on comedy. Because he said that is where you see creativity at its clearest. The next third of the book is about storytelling. And the last third of the book is about science. Because science is created as well, of course. And that's a difficult read because Arthur Kessler is a difficult writer at times. But it's the best book I ever read on creativity. And he uses comedy to begin the book as the clearest expression of the act of creation. So that book was written in 1964, and you started your courses in the early 80s, and you wrote your book, your best-selling book story in the late 90s. And so you've been doing this for a long time. And I'm curious, because as you were talking about comedy, it struck me that there's this like, every generation that they've, that they're too cool for school. You know, there's this comedy now that's like, it's funny, but no one needs to laugh at it because, you know, laughing is isn't cool or, you know, what have you. And so I'm wondering, as you reference this book from the 60s and, and you started your work in the 80s and you developed your book in the 90s, is there something wrong with our generation? You know, I'm, a, no. I'm, an, I'm an older millennial. Like, do we got our heads so far up our asses that we don't realize uh, we're no, missing what's not, important? No, there's nothing wrong. Is that wrong? No, no. We're not just no, trying I mean, too I, hard to I be watch, all cool and everything. Know, I watch, my wife and I watch stand-up comedy at night. And uh, Jim Jeffries and, you know, the great, it's great stand up comics. And uh, they have audiences. I mean, it's incredible. Like these, uh, you know, these Netflix specials. <clears throat> They're doing stand up to 2000 people. And the explosions of laughter are fantastic. And so the note, you're, you're seeing the edit. It's a little bit of a cheat. You want to, you want to watch real comedy, watch Chris Rock special. It's uncomfortable. Yeah, there's that too. The notion that people don't laugh anymore is nonsense because. If, well, I didn't mean that they don't laugh anymore. I, I was wondering more from a storytelling point of view, whether you've seen this change in storytelling types or ego from the storyteller point of view over the decades, or if stories just shift and stories change yeah. and tastes change and it is what it is. Yeah, that's what it is. Because the art forms evolve. And I mean, you know, there's, there's, that's a true statement, obviously. And so what you're looking at is the evolution of an art form. Human nature does not evolve. Society changes in, in ways, but it's never, you know, it, it, there's still reality. You have to make a living. You have to take care of yourself, right? Because there's a genetic imperative to live <laughs> until you finally put a gun to your head and put an end to that. And so the reality is what it is. Human nature is part of that reality. And none of this is changing at the deepest level. Outwardly, there are changes. So, which we would expect. And, uh, you know, people are very uh, concerned about what AI is going to do for our future. <laughs> And I mean, human beings in, are nest making creatures. We build nests. We build cities. Those are nests. Right? If they were ants, we would call it a hive, right? Human beings build nests and they are tool using creatures. 
AI is a tool that we use to build nests. The fundamental process is not changing, but the tools are changing. And the effect of those tools will feed back on the way in which the nest is built. And the way in which the nest is built is going to feed back on how people live and behave within that nest. And so, yeah, there's changes, but the notion that AI will summon the, the future of artificial intelligence will supplant the mind is, from my point of view, just nonsense. AI is a computation. And you can make it incredibly complex. We human beings build these machines. And they, it's called a computer because they compute, they computate, right? If people think that what's going on in your mind is a computation, they're really not paying attention. Your mind is not a computer. It's not anything like a computer. <laughs> the computers are tools <coughs> that we use to do really rapid mathematics, <laughs> right? On a huge scale. That's computation. It's not consciousness. Computers don't make decisions. We make decisions. And then we instruct computers to do that. And we say, and once you make that decision, follow it with the decision of that, whatever. Okay? I mean, we can build decision making into a machine, but we do that. And so I'm not concerned about the future of human beings in that way. I think that the more labor, the more repetitious manual labor that we can get rid of, the better. And if these computers allow us time to explore our our tastes, our feelings, and relationships, and then create, and simply and, and grow. I mean, if, if the, the, the future gives us time to read, that would be an enormous blessing because we've got 3,000 years of human expression, what it is to be a human being in books and plays and then filmed and uh, just being able to learn. Aristotle said 2,500 years ago, he said, the great pleasure of the theater is to learn without being taught. And this is what a great story does. It teaches us about life without teaching us. We involve ourselves willingly. We learn about life and we do not have the experience of, of being taught. We have the experience of experiencing. And so if AI frees us from all unnecessary repetitious work and gives us time to investigate ourselves and investigate human culture and humankind at our leisure. And, you know, it's, it'll be, I don't know if it'll be a paradise, but it's a world I would like to live in. <laughs> oh my goodness. We could talk forever, but I just want to ask you one last question. But before I do, what would be the best way for people to get in touch with you? To get in touch with me? Yeah, if they wanted to, if they wanted to learn more about the book, or if they wanted to learn, uh, I know that you're not doing your courses uh, anymore. Uh, you you yeah, step well, back from that. That's a very nice question. But yeah, just go to my website, keystory.com, and I am doing the story seminars now as webinars. Mm. I'm no longer. I'm 82 years old, so I'm no longer running around the world as I did for 40 years in every country on the planet. My only travel will be from. My office here, <laughs> the dining room, where we're going to set up the new webinar. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so as far as I want to go. Amazing. Final question I have for you. So you have uh, one of the most amazing things that comes with age, which is the wisdom to be able to look back. And so he, here's the, qu- the thought I have or the question I have. Having grown up in a world that is so different from the world that we have today in terms of technology advancements and changes, 
there's no way that when you were growing up, you could have been prepared for the world we're living in today. Equally, there's, it's, it feels like that there's no way that I can prepare my kids for the world yeah. that we're going to be stepping into. So knowing how fast things change, what would be the piece of advice or what would be the one thing that you felt, man, I'm so glad I had that all along the way? Because we could be training people today for things that frankly, we have no idea in 10, 20, 30, 40 years where the world is going or what's going to happen. So what would be the one thing that you felt has served you throughout your career? The thing that prepares you for the future is the past. If you have, if you take the time to learn history, if you take the time to to, uh, to read and experience the great creative works of the past, music, uh, for example, if you work at learning where we've been as human beings, what it is to be a human being for the last tens and tens of thousands of years, if you really <clears throat> learn the past, you will be prepared for the future. Because you will see that it's a variation. Whatever happens in the future is a variation on a theme. It's not really revolutionary. We have had revolutions one after the other. And if you understand the nature of revolutions, when the next revolution comes, it'll be like the ones you already know, and you'll be able to adapt and respond to it. And so all I can uh, advocate is uh, learn from the past and you will be prepared for the future. That is remarkable advice. Robert, thank you so, so much for your time. My pleasure. It was a great talk. We did have fun. 